Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Gieske, and this is The Limiting Factor. One of my predictions before battery day was that Tesla would use plate cooling to improve the thermal management of their battery cells. However, it's now clear that Tesla is using ribbon cooling instead. How did I get this wrong, and why did Tesla choose ribbon cooling? To answer that, today we'll look at why thermal management is important, the unique thermal characteristics of cylindrical cells, and how the tabless electrode affects thermal performance. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. First, why is thermal management so important? Heat regulates how rapidly chemical reactions occur within a battery cell. If a battery is too cold, the reactions become sluggish and performance drops. If the battery is too hot, it begins degrading, which affects cycle life and safety. This sounds straightforward, but let's layer in some complications. A battery pack only performs as well as the weakest link in the battery pack. Depending on what type of battery cell is used, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 cells are used in a Tesla battery pack. If any one of those cells starts failing, as the YouTube channel Dirty Tesla showed, it drags the rest of the battery pack down with it. This means that all of the battery cells need to be managed within tight thermal and electrical boundary conditions. For the thermal aspect, the vehicle's cooling system needs to cool the cells evenly. That's a science all itself, but the basic concept will suffice for this video. But let's say that the cells aren't cooled evenly, or one of the cells has a manufacturing defect and therefore degrades more quickly than the other cells in the pack. This is where the electrical boundary conditions come into play. Let's go a bit deeper to explain why one battery cell dragged down the entire pack in the Dirty Tesla video, and what that means. Even before the battery cell goes into a battery pack, the cells are sorted and matched at the factory to make sure all the battery cells in the pack have a similar capacity. As you can see here, across a Tesla battery pack, the voltage measurements are within about three one thousandths of a volt. You might think this is overkill, but it's not. As Battery University shows here, the greater the difference between the starting capacity of the cells within a battery pack, the more rapidly the battery pack as a whole degrades. After only 20 charge and discharge cycles, a pack that contains cells that vary in capacity by 5% has lost 2% of its starting capacity. For a pack that contains cells with a variation of 12%, the capacity drops by over 10% in only 18 cycles. This is because the low-performing cells have to work harder to keep up with the high-performing cells, which accelerates the degradation of the lowest-performing cells. Then, when the battery management software checks the state of charge, it then has to limit performance to the lowest-performing cells. For example, if the cutoff voltage to protect the cells during discharge is 3 volts, then the first cell to hit that cutoff stops the discharge of the entire pack. This also, of course, affects the state of charge readings because the state of charge is usually measured through voltage. Bear in mind that my understanding of how battery management software works is limited at this point, and I haven't done a deep dive yet. So, if you have a better explanation or if I've made errors here, please feel free to correct or clarify in the comments below. The weakest link effect doesn't just occur between battery cells, but also plays out within battery cells. This is because thermal gradients form within battery cells as they charge and discharge. As this image shows, the core of a battery cell traps heat while the surface remains comparatively cool. The local fluctuations, over time, lead to some areas of the battery cell degrading more quickly than others. The areas that are degraded become the weakest link. To further complicate things, the local fluctuations and degradation can be exacerbated by the quality and consistency of the materials used in the battery cell, as well as the design of the battery cell. What all this means is that high-precision manufacturing throughout the entire supply chain is a prerequisite for thermal management. If only one battery cell were going into an electric vehicle, then the quality and consistency of the cells wouldn't be as important. But when a hundred or more cells are used, and those cells need to perform identically, the requirements become more stringent. To make high-quality battery cells that perform consistently, every material that goes into the battery cells has to be batch-consistent, and every cell has to be manufactured to exacting standards. 
After that, sorting and matching is required to accommodate the minute differences between the battery cells. Then, when the battery cells are installed in the battery pack, the vehicle must be capable of maintaining identical thermal and electrical boundary conditions for every cell in the pack. This is necessary to prevent inconsistent degradation, which would quickly lead to pack failure. And, of course, it goes without saying that in order for the vehicle to maintain those identical thermal and electrical boundary conditions, it requires excellent engineering and design for the battery cell, battery pack, and battery management system. If even one of the design, quality, or control mechanisms we just went through are faulty, that becomes the weakest link. For example, the first-generation Nissan LEAF had a battery that, on average, would lose 10% of its charge in the first two to three years. This is as compared to the Tesla Model S, which loses 10% of its charge in 8 to 10 years. For the most part, the difference in performance between the two vehicles came down to one thing. The first-generation Nissan LEAF was air-cooled, whereas the Model S was liquid-cooled. As a side note, in past videos I've consistently said that one of the reasons why Tesla chose the 4680 form factor was for thermal management. The 4680 was the largest form factor that Tesla could use for a nickel chemistry that also provided the thermal characteristics that they required. Will Tesla move to a larger prismatic cell if they manufacture an LFP or LFMP chemistry? They could, but I haven't heard a convincing argument as to why they should. Prismatic would offer higher energy density at the pack level because square cells offer better packing density. But, if Tesla uses LFP in a robo-taxi or energy storage, they'll want as many cycles out of each cell as possible. A 4680 form factor would maximize the cycle life of an LFP chemistry because it offers more surface area per unit of volume, which would improve thermal management. Let's move on to why my prediction about Tesla using plate cooling for the 4680 was wrong and why they chose ribbon cooling. By plate cooling, I mean cooling the base of the battery cell with a cooling plate that's in contact with the electrode foils that run through the battery cell. By cooling those electrode foils, the core of the battery cell can be directly cooled because the high thermal conductivity of the aluminum and copper foils behave like thermal highways that transport heat out of the cell. By ribbon cooling, I mean cooling the sides of the battery cell. Ribbon cooling is what Tesla showed us at Giga Austin, and it's what Tesla has been using for over a decade to cool their cylindrical cells. My assumption was that side cooling was an inefficient way to cool battery cells because in between each layer of a battery cell is a plastic separator film, which is a thermal insulator. Those insulating layers mean that cooling the core of a battery cell can be difficult with the surface cooling method. I developed the assumption that Tesla would use plate cooling based on this video, which is based on a research paper from 2016 titled, Surface Cooling Causes Accelerated Degradation Compared to Tab Cooling for Lithium-Ion Pouch Cells. The conclusion was that cooling a pouch cell through the surface, or sides, is less efficient than directly cooling the electrode foils through the tabs. I reasoned that this conclusion would apply to cylindrical cells the same way it applies to pouch cells. Based on the information available at the time, that was a fair assumption, but an incorrect one. The same team that produced this paper followed up with another paper in 2021 titled Optimal Tab Design and Cooling Strategy for Cylindrical Lithium-Ion Batteries. Let's look at what they found. They started by creating a thermal model of a 2170 battery cell and validated that model against measurements from an actual 2170 battery cell. The results are on screen. The simulation is in the red circles and the actual measurements are marked by a solid black line for the internal thermocouple, or temperature probe. As you can see, the red circles of the simulation track tightly with the black line of the thermocouple measurements. With the model verified against real-world data, they modeled the thermal characteristics of a 2170 Jelly Roll without the can and a 2170 Jelly Roll with the can. Jelly Roll refers to the role of electrode foils, active material, liquid electrolyte, and plastic separators that make up the battery cell, and the can is the packaging that, among other things, protects the Jelly Roll. They modeled the jelly roll with side cooling, which approximates ribbon cooling, and then modeled it with top and base cooling, which approximates plate cooling. I'll refer to these as side ribbon cooling and base plate cooling. For the jelly roll only, both the side ribbon and base plate cooling appear to be well cooled and evenly cooled, with little difference between the cells. This aligns with what we see in the data. 
With the jelly roll only, the base plate cooling method shows a temperature variation of about 1 degree Celsius less than the side ribbon cooling. As for average temperature, the base plate cooled cell appears to be about 2 to 3 degrees cooler than the side ribbon cooled cell. That is, for the 2170 Jelly Roll only, base plate cooling is slightly better than side ribbon cooling. This aligns with the thermal behavior in a pouch cell and the assumptions I had before battery day. That is, cooling the electrode foils is the most efficient thermal route. But, everything changes with the addition of the metal can. The side cooled cell is blue and white, indicating that it's cooler than the cell using top end base cooling, which is mostly red. Once again, we need to look at the actual data to see what's going on here. The temperature variation between the side ribbon and the base plate cooling is about 1 degree less for the base plate cooling. So, the base plate cooling is still cooling the battery cell more evenly when the jelly roll is in a metal can. But the difference is negligible. However, we now see a dramatic difference in the average cell temperature. The base plate cooled cell is running about 22 to 23 degrees hotter than the side ribbon cooled cell. That is, the obvious choice here is to go with side ribbon cooling over base plate cooling because the average cell temperature is 22 to 23 degrees higher in the base plate cooled cell. What's going on here? Why does the addition of a cell can change the result so dramatically? According to the authors, quote, In the case of cylindrical cells, it is the size of the cooling area that determines the better cooling approach. The can provides a path of high thermal conductivity all around, making side cooling an uncontested winner. End quote. What do they mean by this? When the base or top of the cell can is cooled, there's a local cooling effect to the can, which also cools the electrode foils. But the sides of the cell receive very little thermal relief. Some of the cooling effect from cooling the base and top does work its way around to the sides, but that effect is limited because the side of the can is over three times as long as the base and the top are wide. This is in contrast to side cooling, where most of the surface area of the cell is cooled and the cooling effect easily works its way around to the base and top of the cell, which in turn cools the electrode foils that run through the cell. That is, cooling the sides cools everything, whereas cooling the base and or top means that the sides are neglected. My view is that this is the primary reason why Tesla chose ribbon cooling for the 4680 pack, because it should have better thermal performance than plate cooling. That's not to say there aren't other reasons. Ribbon cooling might also improve safety by creating a barrier of liquid between strings of cells. Or, it might help improve the rigidity of the pack by providing a minor cross-bracing effect, which appears to be what CATL is doing with their Qi Lean battery. Structural cooling. It's worth noting that from what I could find in the paper, the researchers appeared to cool the entire circumference of the cell, whereas Tesla is only cooling about 20% of the circumference. However, cooling only 20% of the circumference is still more surface area than if just the base of the cell were cooled. And, as per the comments by the researchers, for cylindrical cells, it's the size of the cooling area that matters most. Why doesn't Tesla add more cooling? Because that adds cost and weight. As I've said in other videos, Tesla can't just design to one requirement. They have dozens of competing requirements to balance. The point of this video is to highlight why side cooling has the greatest cooling potential for cylindrical cells, and therefore why Tesla chose side cooling for their 4680 structural pack. It may be worth doing another video in the future on the effect of can thickness, the effect of the cell height to diameter ratio, why the thermal gradient along the cooling ribbon isn't as large as you'd expect, and why charge and discharge rates are governed by different factors, some thermal, some electrical, and some chemical. Let's move on to the tabless electrode and how it affects thermal performance. Shun Li et al. summarized the effect of the tabless electrode with this image. The 2170 battery cells with a single tab design show a considerable amount of heat generation from the aluminum and copper foils. This is in contrast to the tabless electrode, labeled here as the all-tab battery cell, which shows no heat generation. The same effect carries over to a 4680 form factor. T.G. Tranter et al. did thermal modeling of a 4680 and some of the results are on screen. The graphs show that ohmic heating in the current collectors, here in pink, was effectively eliminated by switching from a tabbed to a tabless design. 
Ohmic heating in the current collector means heat generated by electricity passing through the electrode foils of the battery cell. Most of the remaining heat generated was in areas like the active materials. Notice that the graph on the left showing a tabbed design is scaled to 0 to 12 watts of heat generation, whereas the right showing a tabless design is scaled to 0 to 5 watts of heat generation. That is, the tabless electrode reduced total heat generation by about 7 watts, or roughly a 60% reduction. If we assume battery cells lose about 5% of their energy to heat during charge or discharge, a tabless electrode would reduce those heat losses by 60% of that, or 3%. For a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, that's 3 kilowatt hours of heat losses eliminated, which is equivalent to running a toaster for 2 hours. The net effect is that although Tesla made the 4680 cell five times larger than a 2170 cell, the tabless electrode design will allow the cell to run at similar charge and discharge rates without causing degradation because each cell is producing less heat per unit of volume. At battery day, Tesla showed this graph to drive that point home. It plots supercharger time increase against cell diameter for a tabbed versus tabless cell. At a 46 mm diameter, a cell with a tabless electrode is able to charge at the same speed as a 21 mm cell with a tabbed electrode. Moving along, as we saw earlier, improving cycle life isn't just about reducing the average temperature of a cell. It's about reducing temperature gradients within the cell. A battery cell with a single tab is a choke point for current flow, which generates heat. The images on screen are the results of heat generation modeling that compares a single tab design to a tabless design. They're rectangular because this is an unwound view of the cathode part of the jelly roll. Note the difference in scale. The image on the left for the single tab design is to the 7th power, whereas the image on the right is to the 5th power. If we divide 4.27 to the 7th power by 1.26 to the 5th power, we find that the image on the left is actually showing 338 times more heat intensity on the orange spots than the image on the right. That is, there's far more localized heat buildup in a battery cell with tabs than a battery cell with a tabless design. The difference is so great that the only way to visualize the difference was for the researchers to change the scale by two orders of magnitude. What this means from a customer perspective is that the greater heat buildup with the tabbed electrode will cause localized degradation that kneecaps battery life. To what extent that affects cycle life, I don't know, but it's an issue that the 4680 battery cell with a tabless electrode will be able to sidestep. Furthermore, the tabless electrode may become increasingly important in the future as the chemistry of battery cells improves and allows for longer cycle life. As we saw with the first generation Nissan LEAF, battery chemistry sometimes isn't the limiting factor for battery life. It's cell and pack design. So, if Tesla starts building grid storage batteries in the future that have a chemistry designed for 5 or even 10,000 cycles or more, the tabless electrode may be a critical innovation to make that happen for cylindrical cells. As an aside, the tabless electrode should also dramatically increase power density by reducing resistance. As Battery University says, resistance is the gatekeeper of the battery. A battery with low resistance delivers high current on demand. In my Where's the Silicon video, I speculated that the power output of the 4680 might be dictated by Tesla's dry electrode tech, which increases the flow of electrons and reduces ionic resistance. I still think that could be a factor, but after researching this video, my view is that electrical resistance will be the greater factor in power density. If that's the case, the tabless electrode will be the main factor in uncorking power output in the 4680. As a final note, do the copper and aluminum plates at the top and bottom of the 4680 cell serve a thermal function? At Tesla, internally, these are known as current collectors. I've had quite a few conversations about them, but no one really knows exactly what they do. My view is that they actually serve multiple functions, and that'll be covered more fully in the next video. In short, I think they do serve a thermal function, but it's the same function that the bottom of the cell can provides. The copper current collector at the base of the 4680 is attached along almost the full perimeter of the cell. Much like we saw with the thermal modeling, any side cooling would work its way from the side of the can to the current collector plate, which would in turn cool the tabless array and therefore the core of the battery cell. But if the current collector was only there to serve that function, I don't think it would have such an intricate design. Again, more on that in the next video. In summary, 
Tesla has been using ribbon cooling since 2012, and now, a decade later, we finally know why that was the best choice from the start and why Tesla is continuing to use ribbon cooling in the new 4680 battery packs. Based on the research I can find, it's the best option for cooling cylindrical cells. The thermally conductive metal can of a cylindrical cell means that cooling the sides of the cell cools the base of the battery cell, which cools the metal foils that run through the battery cell. That is, cooling the sides uses every thermal vector available, whereas cooling just the base and or top means the sides receive very little thermal relief. We've seen many times that Tesla's design choices for batteries are often prescient and prove to be durable over time. I think the same will be true of the 4680 battery cell and structural pack with ribbon cooling. Many people are comparing the Tesla 4680 battery pack to the BYD Blade battery pack and the CATL Qi Lean battery pack. I'll offer deeper analysis in the future, but suffice to say that I think Tesla's 4680 structural pack with ribbon cooling is just as good as anything else on the market, and may in fact have long-term advantages, even for LFP-based chemistries. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to my YouTube members and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.